For the first time, we are hearing a second-by-second -second account of the bloody manhunt for the Boston Marathon bombers and from the man who escaped the Zarnev brothers. Gas station surveillance cameras caught the moment Dun Meng quite literally ran for his life, escaping the Zarnev brothers who had carjacked him earlier in the night. He had pulled over his Mercedes SUV to answer a text message when he says Tamerlan Zarnev pulled a gun on him and got in the car. For almost two hours, they drove around as the brothers used Meng's ATM card to get cash. They pulled up to a gas station and Joe Carr went in to get snacks. That's when Meng saw an opening and sprinted to the gas station across the street. Once inside, he pleaded with the cashier to call 911. Tell me what happened. Somebody took your car? Yes. And what happened when they took their car? They say that they are the. They, 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 you know, the. Explosion. They are Muslims. They, they what? They, they, they are the suspect of the marathon explosion. A GPS locator inside Meng's car allowed police to track it in real time and find the most wanted men in America. The carjacking happened just an hour after the murder of MIT police officer Sean Collier. Bicyclist Nathan Harmon rode by Collier's police cruiser that fateful night and says he saw Joe Carr's head inside the vehicle. As he rode by, he told jurors, quote, he snapped up, stood up, turned around and looked startled. We made eye contact. I remember thinking he had a big nose, but nothing beyond that. In court, he pointed to Jarnev and said, that's him. He has a blue shirt on. And the drama continues to play out in a Boston federal court this coming week as prosecutors lay out their case for the death penalty against Jokar Zarnev. Joining us now for insight and analysis, criminal defense attorney Philip Holloway and former prosecutor Peter Odom. Peter, first to you, explain the prosecution's strategy here in pulling out every single detail in terms of how this guy ran out from the car, what the Zarnev brothers were saying, what they were doing. Why not just sort of gloss over all of this and get right to the forensics of the bombing? Remember that the defense strategy in this case has been quite bold. They've taken the question of who did this and how it was done off the table by conceding that Chokar actually did the bombing. So the whole focus here is on who is Jokar? Is he the evil jihadist or is he a misled college student? So what this state, what the government is trying to do here is to get as much detail of these horrible, horrific killings, hijackings and murders on the table so that the jurors are less inclined to cut him a break. So, Phil, as Peter points out here, the defense has essentially said, yes, it's him, but they didn't plead guilty. What is the defense strategy behind that? It almost harkens back to Clarence Darrow days. You took the words right out of my mouth. It does. I think she's channeling Clarence Darrow, except in the Leopold and Loeb cases in Chicago, he actually entered a guilty plea. In this case, Leland, they did not enter a guilty plea. What she's doing is she's allowing this jury to have the satisfaction, if you will, of finding him guilty, not once, not twice, but writing the word guilty on the verdict form 30 times so that when it comes time to ask to the jury to spare his life, she has some credibility left with them and she just might succeed. So, Peter, a lot of people have compared this in some way to the D.C. sniper trial right. where it was the younger man who was spared the death penalty right. sentenced to life in prison. Do you think this strategy works? And as a prosecutor, how do you counter it? I think that the strategy will not work here. I think that the state, the government here has a much stronger case. There's a lot more evidence that Johar was acting very much on his own. There's videotape of him planning the bomb. There's videotape of, it, of his independently running away. There's videotape of him uh, running toward the police car where that officer was eventually killed. There's so much evidence that he wasn't just a forlorn, lost, misguided college student. I, I, I don't think that this is going to go the same way as the Malvo case went. Phil, you agree, or is there something else that the defense attorneys have up their sleeve? Well, everybody knows he's guilty as homemade sin. So uh, I agree with Peter. All that stuff is true. You know, juries like to hear the defense accept responsibility. Uh, in federal cases, when, when it, statistics have shown that when you take the death penalty, for example, in federal court, only about a third of the time uh, since the 80s, I think, do juries actually impose the death penalty in these federal cases. Now, this, of course, is not your ordinary case, as we all know, but statistically speaking, I think she may have a chance here. 
And in terms of this, in terms of a chance, Peter, where does it go from here in terms of the trial? Do they just want to keep teasing out as prosecutors, have this go on as long as they can, make the jury sort of sit there yes. and listen and experience all yes. the horror? Exactly. The more the jurors understand how cold-blooded and how calculated this was, and the more they understand that Tsarnaev's motivation, the one living bomber, was revenge on Americans, the less likely they are to say, hey, let's cut him a break and uh, spare him from the death penalty. Well, I will give you as the prosecutor, Peter, the last word. Philip Holloway, Peter Odom, appreciate both of you being here with us today and your analysis. Obviously, this trial will go on for a long time. We'll hear back from you, gentlemen, shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. Thanks, Lou. Nice good to day. see you. And we have